today to a study of the Word. This is Evangelist Jimmy Swaggart along with Bob Cornell, who's been with us all week, and we are so glad to have him. And we're glad to have you because you are the reason for this program. We are studying the great epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Galatians. We are in this, on the sixth verse, and um, these, these things are just loaded with, with great truths, and uh, of course, as all of the Word of God is. I want Bob to read the text and of this sixth verse, same thing we read yesterday, and I'll read the notes. And because you are sons... We now have many privileges. God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts. Because we are sons, the Holy Spirit has been sent to take up His permanent residence in our hearts. Crying, Abba, Father. This means it is the Holy Spirit who is doing the crying and does so to the Father on our behalf. Heavenly Father, help us today. And Lord, that we might make it clear the text may become real in our hearts, that the people may understand it, and that you may be glorified, and we'll ask it all in the most gracious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. I want to deal, first of all, with the term crying Abba Father. It's, it's the Holy Spirit who says this to the Father, in a sense, but here's why he is saying it. He is saying it that this particular one in whom he inhabits their heart, their life, my heart, my life, your heart, your life, that he's saying that now, God, you are their father. Think about that. That's what the term means. Abba Father probably could be translated Daddy God, and it not be out of whack. Now, Bob's the, the, the Greek uh, authority here. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> well, Abba is actually an Aramaic word, which is Aramaic is very closely related to Hebrew. And here, when Paul made this statement, again, he, he used Aramaic, and then right after that, he used a Greek word, pater, for uh, for the word father, but so, they're pretty close to the same, aren't they? In in meaning, father, they're, father, they're pretty much the same. But it's interesting that Paul, led by the Holy Spirit, put it this way: used Aramaic and then used Greek. Aramaic, I believe, uh, was he was meaning that uh, w when the Holy Spirit comes into our life, uh, he's the uh, he's the Savior, he's the Father for both the Jew and the Greek. Uh, by yeah. saying it okay. this way. That's good. Both That's the good. Jew and the Greek, by mm -hmm. faith, accept Jesus Christ Both into the Jew their heart. Both the Jew and Gentile. I'm sorry, Jew and Gentile, right, I'm sorry. Accept Jesus Christ into their heart to be the Savior and Lord, and He's the Father of both the Jew and the Gentile. Mm -hmm. He is, He cries out, Abba, Father. But he's proclaiming that it's so. That's right, exactly. It's so. I wouldn't be here. In essence, the Holy Spirit is saying, were this person not your child now, Amen. not a son, right. son or daughter of God in one's heart, in one's life. And the word Father, Brother Swaggart, it emphasizes really two points. It emphasizes the point of origination, that, that he is our originator, but also it emphasizes strongly relationship, that now through what Christ did for us at the cross, we have a relationship, a living, loving relationship with the Creator God. He's our Father now. <coughs> and th th there is nothing more wonderful than that. Amen. I, uh, I come to the office every morning and uh, before I go on the air over radio, and um, um, the Sun Life Radio Network has 80 stations now, which belongs here to the ministry. And, of course, it's gospel 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And um, Gabe and Jill, Gabe is my grandson, Jill is his wife. They have this beautiful little girl that I show here on the program. Um, Sam is her name. She's a little doll. Anyway, uh, they, they read the Expositor Study Bible, and they read it for an hour, the notes and, and the whole thing. Anyway, I will be listening to that as I come into the office, and time and time again, something they read, the presence of God will fill my heart, and I'll begin to praise the Lord, sometimes with tears. But that relationship with Him, there is nothing in the world more important than that. And I believe, Bob, I believe that a person who is truly born again, that that relationship will be there. With some, it's greater than others. We understand that. 
Um, but nevertheless, if that relationship is there, if they are truly born again, the relationship is there. And there will be signs of that relationship. As I've just mentioned, I don't mean that people will react exactly as I do every time. That's not the idea. But God is not an impersonal uh, wisp out there in space. He is a person, one could say. He's not a human being, but he's a person. And he has feelings. And um, um, the, the emotions that we experience, he experiences them too, although on a much more refined level. But I'm trying to say that, that the, the person who refers to themselves as, as a Christian, as a believer, and they never sense the presence of God, there, has, there is never any reaction in their hearts and lives. There's never a moving of the Holy Spirit to where they just worship the Lord. I don't mean for others to see them. I meant by themselves. As, as at times, it doesn't happen all the time, but as at times, the Spirit of God will move upon a person. If that relationship is not there, it never is there, and they're claiming salvation on, on some, something they've said or done or they've joined a church or whatever the case, I seriously doubt that person's salvation. Right. And all, only God knows ultimately right. I, I can't make if the a person judgment. is saved. But as you said, though, and it's so yeah. right, that if a person truly does have the Holy Spirit on the inside and has a relationship with the Father, it's going to evidence itself in some way or form. It's going to come out. Right, right. And ultimately, I think that evidence is a changed life. Right. Uh, yeah, oh, it is. That, that, it that's is. the ultimate evidence is a changed life. Well, yeah, but it most definitely is a changed life. But that changed life, it, 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 we are changed and we are being changed. And, that's right. Uh, we're saved and we're being saved. That's right. Um, but getting back to the relationship that God is a person, he's not an, a, a something that's just a figment of one's imagination. Um, that relationship, you know, my, my son has a relationship with me. I have a relationship with him. I have a relationship with my grandsons. Now, God has no grandsons, but he does have sons and daughters. And, and uh, but it, I, I, I don't understand people who call themselves Christians. They're never touched by the Holy Spirit. They, they never even, it's never there in any capacity, uh, according to their own admission. You know, I don't believe in that. I don't do that or whatever the case. I, I really, I know you're right. I have to leave there. The, the Lord is the one who, who judges their salvation, not me. But I have doubts about that person. I'll leave it between them and God. But uh, if it, there's a relationship there, there's going to be some kind of sign of that relationship. Right. And most Pentecostal, or, or sorry, I should say, in most non-Pentecostal circles, uh, the teaching is that God, we are not, we, we don't live by feeling. We don't live well, by true. emotion. We don't. That's which we right. don't. But the, it goes to an extreme right. in which... Uh, you don't have to feel. You don't feel God's presence. God doesn't speak to you. Uh, if he does, if you claim that he does, well, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. Uh, that is what, that's the teaching of, of most non-Pentecostal circles, which that that teaching goes directly against God's word. Right. Uh, as and, and having a living relationship with God, uh, we can feel his presence. We are to feel his presence. We're to seek his presence. We, we can talk to God uh, in prayer. He will speak back to us uh, in prayer by his spirit. And so it's a living, loving relationship that we have with our heavenly father. And, you know, Brother Swaggart, it's, it's interesting that in the, in the ministry, earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, Jesus so many times referred to God as our father, either mm -hmm. his father, when he was mm -hmm. referring to God, he spoke to him as his father. But he did it in a different way than we refer to God as our father. Right, and, and, and yes, very different. But uh, he, when he spoke to us as believers, though, as adopted children of God, yeah. he, spill, he still spoke to God as our Father. In the Lord's Prayer, yeah. he said, when you approach God, you can say, our Father. But he's our Father on a different level than he was the Father of Jesus Christ. But addressing God in that manner was very different 
from the way the Jews at that time thought of God. Mm -hmm. uh, again, yes, Jesus, right, Jesus right. and that's the point right. I was making, but mm -hmm. he emphasized the point that we as believers, uh, having accepted Jesus Christ into our hearts by faith, and we're living by faith, we can approach God as our heavenly Father. Turn to Romans 8 and 16 in your, in your uh, Bible right there, and I want you to read the text, and I'll read the notes. And we're talking about relationship of Romans 8 and 16. The Spirit itself himself bears witness with our spirit. Means that he is constantly speaking and witnessing certain things to us. That we are the children of God. Meaning that we are such now and should enjoy all the privileges of such. We can do so if we will understand that all these privileges come to us from God by the means of the cross. Now the scripture here plainly says that the spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's relationship. That's right. That's relationship. Amen. All right, go to Romans 8 and 26. Just a page over, uh, somewhere there. Romans 8 and 26. Likewise, the Spirit, Holy Spirit, also helps our infirmities. The help given to us by the Holy Spirit is made possible in its entirety by and through what Jesus did at the cross. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Signals the significance of prayer, but also that without the Holy Spirit, all is to no avail. But the Spirit itself himself makes intercession for us. He petitions or intercedes on our behalf. With groanings which cannot be uttered. Not groanings on the part of the Holy Spirit, but rather on our part, which pertains to that which comes from the heart and cannot properly be put into words. Now, I, I want to talk to you a few moments about the intercession the Holy Spirit makes for us. It is different than the intercession that Christ makes. In, in Hebrews, it tells us that he ever lives to make intercession for us. The intercession that Christ makes is totally different than the intercession the Holy Spirit makes. The intercession the Holy Spirit makes is different than the intercession that Christ makes. I said it the same way, two different ways, but the same means the same thing. Now, Let's look at first what the intercession that Christ makes for us. That's Hebrews, and it's 7, I believe it is. You can help me here if that's not right. I think it is. Chapter 7 of Hebrews, and uh, here it is, 25th verse. Could you read that, please? Hebrews 7 and 25. Wherefore he, the Lord Jesus Christ, is able also to save them to the uttermost. Proclaims the fact that Christ alone has made the only true atonement for sin. He did this at the cross. Who come unto God by him. Proclaims the only manner in which man can come to God. Seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. His very presence by the right hand of the Father guarantees such. With nothing else having to be done. Hebrews 1.3 Now, here's the point I wish to make. The type of intercession that Christ makes for us, and he alone can make this type of intercession, is for sin on our behalf. It's when we fail him, when we sin, when we do something wrong, he is making intercession for us constantly. Now, I want you to get that. The Holy Spirit does not make that kind of intercession. And because he is not the one who died on that cross... It's Christ who paid the price. It's Christ who died on the cross. And it's Christ who makes the intercession for us as it regards sin, failure, disobedience, transgression, iniquity, and so forth. All right. How does he make that intercession? Does he, let's just say that Bob does something wrong, whatever it might be. Does Christ turn to God the Father and say, Father, Bob did something wrong, but I'm interceding on his behalf, etc. No, he doesn't do that. Well, does he do anything? No, he doesn't. He doesn't do anything, but yet he, his very, let me put it this way, his very presence guarantees the intercession. The fact that he is beside the Father, he is seated at the right hand of the Father. We are told that in Hebrews as well. He is seated at the right hand of the Father means that God has accepted his sacrifice. It's done total and complete. His very presence there guarantees the intercession. 
just his presence. He ever lives to make intercession for us. His life, his living, his presence in, at the throne of God guarantees intercession. Every one of us need that intercession 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's ongoing, constant, it never ends. The scripture tells us that we are constantly coming short of the glory of God. All have sinned, come short of the glory of God. That means not that we it happened in the past, which it did, but that we are constantly now coming short of the glory of God. The greatest Christian among us, whomever that may be, is constantly coming short of the glory of God. If you understand what sin is, and you understand yourself, and you understand the Lord, you'll understand that. Uh, there is far more to sin. The, the thoughts of foolishness is sin. He who knows to do uh, the right thing and do, doesn't do it, to him it's sin. And you can go on and on in that capacity. So how can we remain saved when we're constantly coming short? That doesn't mean now that we are purposely out here sinning. It doesn't mean, well, I can do anything I want to do, live any way I want to live, and he's making intercession for me and everything's fine. It's not. You're a fool, if you'll pardon my expression, if you believe such a thing. But the finest Christian in the world, the most godliest, is constantly coming short of the glory of God. For that's what it means in the Greek original, as Paul wrote it. The way we remain saved and in union with Christ is because he is making intercession for us. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He ever lives to make intercession. He can do that because he is the one who paid the price at Calvary's cross. I couldn't make it, I couldn't make it, uh, I want to say a day. I couldn't make it an hour. Right. Neither can you without that intercession. I read once and it, it, moved, it moved me greatly. I, I, I believe it was written, well, no need going into detail, but the dear brother said, look away from your 10,000 failures to that golden headband on the mitre of the high priest that says holiness unto the Lord. And, and when, he, when I read that, it, it gripped me greatly. Look away from your 10,000 failures to that golden headband that says holiness unto the Lord. The high priest that wore that was a type of Christ. And that means that my salvation is in Christ. It's, it's, it, have I ever failed? Yes, I failed the Lord. You have, he has, every soul that's ever lived who knows Christ has. But, that's not held against me because Amen. it's in Christ Amen. and under the blood. <laughs> Hallelujah to the Lamb. Intercedes. Okay, let's get to the Holy Spirit here now. How does the Holy Spirit intercede for us? What type of intercession is it? It says it here very carefully. He said, uh, but the Spirit itself, it should have been translated himself, makes intercession for us. All right. How does he do that? Or let's, let's change it. What type of intercession is it? It's intercession as it regards the help that he gives us. The word parakletos means one called alongside to help. The Lord said, I'll send you another comforter. That means helper. A parakletos, one called alongside to help. He'll help you. And let me put it this way. If you're a carpenter, he'll help you be a better carpenter. If you're a school teacher, he'll help you be a better teacher. If, if you are a pilot for an airplane, he'll help you to be a better pilot. If you dig ditches for a living, he'll help you to be a better dig, ditch digger. I don't care what your occupation in life is. If it's honest and right, he'll help you. He'll help you as it regards power to live the life you ought to live. He'll help you in every aspect of your life and living. I couldn't do without the Holy Spirit and neither can you as it regards living for God. Now, I want to know how the Holy Spirit works in my heart and in my life. Now, that's, that's a great question. How does he work? Somebody said, what do you mean, how does he work? You see, in most Christian circles today, even the Pentecostal circles, and we who claim to know so much about the Holy Spirit, 
He is mostly just taken for granted. Just taken for granted. He's there and we don't think much more about it. But let me get back to what I originally said. Everything in your life that, that is done for the Lord, righteousness, holiness, growing in grace and the knowledge of the Lord, fruit of the Spirit, gifts of the Spirit, everything is carried out by the Holy Spirit. You can't do any of it. You cannot perfect any of it. You can say, I'm going to be holy, and you can wear your hair lady down to your back, and sir, you can cut it all off until there's nothing but a top knot on your head. You can do whatever you want to do that thinks it makes you holy. It doesn't. That's right. You can join every church in the country. It won't make you holy. You can, you can do whatever. It won't make you holy. The Holy Spirit alone can make you holy. And I want to tell you on tomorrow's program how that he does it. Now, this is very, very important. Uh, and please, there is nothing you can hear as a believer, I think, that would be more important than what we're going to teach you tomorrow. How the Holy Spirit works. And Brother Swigert, most believers have never really thought that. They never, they've never even asked themselves that question, how does the Holy Spirit work? But yet, the answer to that question is critical for us to walk in victory. Right. It's a simple answer. It's, it's not a convoluted answer or a, uh, a great theological quotation which most people can't understand. It's very simple, very easy to understand. But tragically, most Christians don't have the foggiest idea. They just take him for granted. He's there, and I hope he helps me. And, and if he's speaking tongues a little bit, well, that's wonderful. And, and I speak in tongues just about every day of my life. But that's not what we're talking about here. Don't miss tomorrow. All right.